Well, let's hop back for a second to our derivation of the two-body equation of motion. In the course of this derivation, we actually came across something very important, but didn't pause to call it out. So let's do that now. You'll notice that we have on the left-hand side of this quality, the second derivative of the orbital radius vector r. And on the right-hand side, we have some scalar values multiplied by the same orbital radius r. So what this equation is telling us is that the second derivative of r is proportional to r itself. When two vectors are proportional to one another, that means that they also have to be parallel to one another. In this case, they are anti-parallel because this has a negative sign and this is a strictly positive quantity. But regardless of whether a vector is parallel or anti-parallel to another vector, their cross product will be zero. So what this is telling us is that the cross product between the second derivative of r and r itself will be zero. And this is a very, very important finding. And this will play a key role in an upcoming derivation. But before we can get to that derivation, we have to introduce a new quantity. And that is the specific angular momentum. In all of astrodynamics, specific means divided by the mass. And so this angular momentum is defined very much like the inertial angular momentum that we have defined previously, except that it is scaled by the mass of whichever particle we happen to be talking about. And so to differentiate between the full angular momentum and the specific angular momentum, we will denote the specific angular momentum just by boldface h with no additional adornments. And it is defined as the position vector r crossed with the velocity vector or the inertial derivative of r. So what can we do with this specific angular momentum? Well, first, let's take the inertial derivative of it. Applying the product rule to both terms, linking up the specific angular momentum, we get that its derivative is equal to the derivative of r crossed with the derivative of r, which of course goes to zero because any vector crossed with itself is zero, plus r crossed with the second derivative of r, which we have just established is also zero because they are anti-parallel by the differential equation we derived from the application of Newton's law of gravity. And so both these terms are zero, which means that the derivative of angular momentum is strictly zero, which means that the angular momentum is conserved as it must be since this is a multi-particle system with no external forces and internal forces acting strictly along the separation vectors between the particles. We can further cross the two-body equation with the specific angular momentum to find where we are now substituting mu as the gravitational parameter which you will recall is the gravitational constant times the sum of the two particle masses. And as a shorthand, we will be calling the norm of R just the scalar R quantity, like so. Let's simplify this a little bit to find where we have now substituted in our definition for specific angular momentum. And we see that we have exactly our standard triple cross product, remembering that a cross B cross C is equal to back minus cab. We apply this to this system and find that is R dotted into its derivative in the R direction minus the R dotted into itself, which you will recall is the same as norm squared R in the direction of its derivative. Rewriting all of this and cleaning it up a bit, we have that is the second derivative of the position vector between the two particles crossed with the specific angular momentum is equal to negative the gravitational parameter over the distance between the two particles cubed times the quantities r dotted into its derivative in the r direction minus scalar r squared times the derivative of vector r. Let's consider these two terms independently, starting with this one. If we rewrite this in component form using a standard basis E sub i, then we'll get that this expression is equivalent to where you will recall that E sub i is the standard basis of our inertial frame. And so using the rules of vector products that we've previously established, it's relatively straightforward to convince yourself that this is true. The one caveat being 
that it's incredibly important to recall that R sub I dot, these scalar terms, these are scalar derivatives of the components of the vector R in this basis. From this, what we find is that this whole first term is equal to That is the magnitude of R multiplied by the derivative of the magnitude of R. And in this case, this is now a simple scalar derivative. And so it is frame independent. Again, it is very worthwhile to prove this relationship to yourself and to be able to trace back from here all the way to here. So let's rewrite our equation one more time. The second derivative of the position vector of one particle respect to the other cross with the specific angular momentum of that particle is equal to, that is the gravitational parameter over the separation distance squared times the scalar derivative of the separation distance in the direction of the separation vector plus the gravitational parameter over the separation distance times the vector derivative of the separation distance vector. And this entire expression by applying the product rule in reverse is equivalent to, again, please verify this, that if you apply the product rule to mu over the norm of R times vector R, you will get these two terms. As a brief aside, so if you're taking notes, make sure that you indicate that this is separate from our previous derivation. This is a useful step that we will then fold back into the preceding derivation. Consider the expression, that is, the inertial derivative of the quantity inertial derivative of vector r crossed with vector h. We apply the product rule, and we get, that is, the second derivative of r crossed with h plus the first derivative of r crossed with the first derivative of h. However, we have already established that h is a conserved quantity, which means that this term goes to zero which means that this whole cross product goes to zero. And therefore, the inertial derivative of the quantity, first derivative of R crossed with H, is the same as the second derivative of R crossed with H. We now take this result and return back to our previous expression, and that allows us to write So what we have done is returned all the way to here and replaced the second derivative of R crossed with H with what we now know to be the equivalent expression of the first derivative of the cross product first derivative of R with H and set that equal to the resulting right-hand side, which is the first derivative of mu over scalar R in the R vector direction. If we rearrange things and bring this over to the left-hand side, we will get, that is, the derivative of the quantity first derivative of R cross with H minus mu over R in the R vector direction is all equal to zero. And we now have an exact differential equal to, to zero, which means that we can integrate both sides with respect to time. And what that'll do is simply cancel this derivative and add a constant of integration on this side. So we are going to integrate this entire expression and get, we have chosen our constant of integration to have the form mu e, where e is some vector quantity. Note that because this is a vector expression, the constant of integration has to be a vector for the dimensionality to match. And because the constant of integration is arbitrary and mu is itself a constant, we can make this be our constant of integration. The reason for this will become apparent when we get to the final form of the equation that we are looking for. We will rewrite this slightly to group all of the gravitational parameters on one side and get so the derivative of r crossed with the specific angular momentum is equal to the gravitational parameter times the quantity r vector over r, which you will recognize is the same as the unit direction r hat, plus this constant of integration e, which was known as the eccentricity vector. Note the directions of the quantities involved. We know that H is conserved, and because this is a central force problem, it is going to be orthogonal to the plane of motion. 
That is the position of the particles, the relative positions of the particles and the relative velocity vectors of the particles will always lie in a single plane that is orthogonal to the angular momentum direction, h, which means that the cross product is going to lie in that plane itself because it is in a direction orthogonal to h. Similarly, the unit direction r hat lies in that plane because that is the plane in which all of the motion happens, in which the position vector r always lies. And so that means that this constant of integration, this eccentricity vector, must also lie in that plane. And so the implication here is that e dotted into h must be zero. Just like r and the first derivative of r, the e vector must be orthogonal to h. As a final step, we are going to dot both sides of this expression with the orbital radius vector r, and we will find the left-hand side here is a scalar triple product, which you will recall is circularly permutable. And so this expression is equivalent to where this first term is our exact definition of the specific angular momentum. And so this entire term is equivalent to h norm squared, which we will further define as scalar h squared. The right-hand side can be rewritten as where this first term is the norm squared of r divided by the norm of r, leaving just scalar r. And the second term is r e scalar, which is the magnitude of e, times cosine nu, where we have implicitly defined nu as the angle between r and e. That is, nu is the arc cosine of the dot product of the directions of r and e. And so we have now the scalar analytical solution for all time of the two-body system. The differential equation for the two-body system leads directly to the solution, where the magnitude of the orbital radius vector is equal to h squared over mu divided by the quantity 1 plus e cosine nu. h is a conserved quantity, and so h squared is a constant. The gravitational parameter mu is a constant. And the magnitude of the eccentricity vector, which you recall is a constant of integration, is also a constant. And therefore, the only time varying quantity in this entire expression is this angle nu. And so we have a one parameter expression that defines the orbit of this system for all time.